Hello there, today I am here to bring you the second half of my March wrap up. If you want to see what I read in the first half of the month, I will link the video for that down below. I've read a fair amount in this half of the month, so I'm going to get straight into it with the audiobooks I've listened to. I think after this month I'm probably going to do a separate audio wrap up um, and I've been debating that issue for a while now but it's getting to the point where my wrap ups are so long and they're taking so long to edit because I'm speaking about audiobooks for quite a lot of them um, so I think I'm going to yeah, separate audiobooks off unless obviously I haven't listened to many and then I might put them into my normal wrap up so from now on if you want to hear what I've been listening to look out for the separate video on that one um, but for today I will be talking about about the audiobooks that I've listened to. Admittedly, I've kind of stepped back a little bit from audiobooks. Um, I think it's quite refreshing now and again to listen to podcasts or something like that, which is a bit different and is on a different subject. Um, sometimes it gets a bit much to be listening to books all the time, talking about books and also reading books every evening. Um, it gets a bit heavy, so sometimes I do like to step back and not listen to as many, which is what I've done in this half of the month. But I have still finished two audiobooks. Um, the first one of those was Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig. This was narrated by Matt Haig himself, which I really enjoyed. I love it when authors narrate their own memoirs. I think it just makes the words all the more impactful um, and it makes the book much more enjoyable. Also, Matt Haig's voice is really lovely and soothing. If you have ever listened to an audiobook by John Ronson, Matt Haig's voice really reminded me of John Ronson's narration voice. And it just kind of has this really soothing and gentle tone to it, which I really enjoyed. Um, so, Reasons to Stay Alive is, it's been around for a while now, I'm sure a lot of people have already read this, but it's a memoir on Matt Haig's experience with anxiety and depression um, and it sort of looks at how it's affected him at different periods through his life especially when he was 24 and had his first sort of attack of really severe anxiety and he was living in Ibiza at the time and it kind of looks at how that impacted his life and how it sort of made him question everything he'd experienced in his childhood and sort of little things that he'd thought were just eccentricities and quirks that he had. Um, he sort of looked back at them in a different light and also it looks at how he's experienced anxiety and depression going forward in his life. I've wanted to read this for a while but it's really small and it's quite expensive to buy so I've kind of been putting it off but I bought it with my credits on Audible because I kind of feel like that's more justified um, and I'm really glad I listened to it because as I say having Matt Haig's voice really made it a personal experience and I really thoroughly enjoyed the experience of listening to it um, so I'd recommend that if you get the chance. Um, what I really loved about this book is that it looks obviously at the issue of depression in a very accessible way. I I think a lot of the time books like this are kind of removed or that they feel like they're not relevant to you, um, especially for me anyway, that's my experience with things like this. But this book really spoke to me. I, I, I would say it's really worth a read and I also loved the fact that obviously everyone deals with situations differently and for some people medication and therapy and things like that are the best way forward. Um, but Matt Haig's very open in the fact that he's not against those things but they didn't work for him. Um, instead he kind of tries to deal with his depression and his anxiety through things like meditation and yoga and recognising how he feels and knowing what he can do to alter that feeling, so for instance eating more or sleeping more. I think that's really refreshing because I think there is this habit to think that the only way that you can get better from something like that is to take medication um, and obviously as Matt Haig says time and again he, he doesn't have anything against that it works for some people but it didn't work for him and I think that was a really nice sort of thing to have because it, it gives you hope that medication isn't the only way through that kind of issue um, so I would highly recommend this I also listened to Asking For It by Louise O'Neill and that was narrated by Fee McMahon um, this is is obviously again a book that has been around for a while and everybody has read it. It's, it's all about rape culture and blame um, in sort of a teen society. As a YA book, you know that I do not like YA, um, I really have things against YA books, but this was the best YA book I have read in a very long time. Um, and it's a book that I wish that had been around when I was a child. I still only gave it four stars because there were still things that I didn't love. Um, obviously it's written for a much younger audience, but in terms of the general message I think this was really, really impactful. So this is about a girl called Emma, I think was her name, um, and she's not a very pleasant girl. Um, she's kind of the popular girl and she likes all the boys to fancy her and she's a bit of a flirt. And she's kind of famous for, you know, giving in to guys and sleeping with guys, but she's 18 years old so, you know, 
there's nothing wrong with that and she's not like a bad bad person um but she's definitely a fair and she definitely knows that she's a pretty girl and then something happens where she's not drugged she does voluntarily take drugs um but while she is under the influence she ends up sleeping with a guy and throughout she's not really sure that she wants to be doing it but she kind of thinks ah whatever it's happening um and then later on she goes out with the same guy and a few of his friends and takes more drugs um, and then she can't remember a thing that happens um, but videos start emerging on the internet which reveal that sexual activity took place that she either wasn't able to consent to or that she can't remember consenting to um, and a trial ensues um, and it looks at the effect of the community um, and the way that the community view her because the guys involved in this situation are guys that are well respected within that community um, so people sort of turn on her especially given her past experiences and the fact that she did go, go through with sex with one of these guys earlier in the evening um, so it kind of looks at that issue of well you consented that time so surely the next time you know your consent's already been given sort of thing um, I think this is so so good and it what I like about this as well is that it doesn't just deal with Emma's case um, there's also incidences of other teenage girls that she's friends with um, not being raped necessarily but feeling as though they're not in a position to say no or that they can't say no and I think that's something that is one of the biggest issues alongside rape culture is the fact that I think a lot of the time teenage girls feel like they can't say no or that they, they don't want to appear frigid um, and things like that and I think it's really impactful that this book looks at that issue as well. Um, the thing I would say that I didn't like about this is the fact that the, the incident happens and then we suddenly jump forward a year um, and I don't know whether this was because I was listening to it so I missed the bit where it jumped forward um, but I felt like it was suddenly they were talking about it being a year ago and I was still thinking it as being only a few months ago um, and that kind of that time period didn't really work for me because I feel like we missed a lot of the initial thoughts that Emma was having about what was happening to her um, I also think it would have been interesting to look into fears of pregnancy because obviously this is set in Ireland um, and I think that would have been an interesting subject to look at not necessarily that she was pregnant after what happened because I think that would take it down a whole different route but that she was worried about being pregnant I feel like we didn't have that side of the story um, and I think that would have been realistically a worry obviously um, but in general I think this book is so important as I say I wish that it had been around when I was a teenager I would definitely urge any teenagers in my life to read it and I think it's one of those books that's going to really help teenage girls feel stronger in themselves when they're dealing with their relationships with men then on to the physical books so we have Jamie Kinnery's Bright Lights Big City um, I read this because it's a book written in second person and there aren't many books written in second person and I have to say the only one that I've read which was Reluctant Fundamentalist by Mohsin Hamid um, didn't work for me I didn't think it was done very well but then that was kind of written in I think second person is something that's quite open to interpretation and the Reluctant Fundamentalist is written in terms of you as in the narrator is having a conversation with another character so it gets quite um, clunky at times and sort of telly. This is written in a much more general second person so it kind of works a lot better. It's basically about a man who is living in the fast lane, you know he's taking a lot of cocaine and he's kind of not sleeping properly, his relationship's fallen apart and he's in trouble at work all the time and and it kind of just looks at his life. Um, it, it's a bit of a laddie story and it didn't leave that much of an impact on me. But as I say, I did enjoy the fact that it's written quite well in second person and it was good enough. I enjoyed it. I wouldn't say it's necessarily stuck with me, sadly. Then I read Ali Smith's How To Be Both. Um, I, I'm feeling strange about Ali Smith at the moment. I think uh, the accidental, when I read it, completely blew me away. But every Ali Smith that I've read since, apart from Hotel World, which is one of hers that's not that well spoken about, um, every other Ali Smith I've read has been kind of lacklustre. It, it's not quite hit the mark. So this is probably one of her most spoken about books on booktube, I'd say. Um, and it is the story of two different characters. So we have, jo my book started with Georgie. I know the, the books do switch between the perspective you get what time. Um, but my book started with Georgie, who is a girl living in the present day. Um, and she's dealing with the aftermath of her mum's death and the other section was written from the point of view of the artist that Georgie and her mum have been interested in. 
um, whom I can't remember their name, um, because the second section really didn't speak to me. I was really enjoying this book. I loved Georgie's section, I loved her story, um, and then you switch and it just didn't gel with me. I just couldn't get into the second story. I almost feel like I would have been better off having the second story first. Um, I think that probably would have worked better for me and I probably would have had an overall better feeling for this book. But the second section just really didn't speak to me. I wasn't inclined to pick it up. I didn't really gel with the story. Um, it deals with all the same issues that Ali Smith often deals with. So there's art in there. Um, there's also the worth of the artist and obviously issues of gender and sexuality are discussed in both of the sections. But yeah, the second section, it just kind of fell flat. I, I didn't really understand what was happening or really what Ali Smith was trying to say with the second section. And I think a lot of people from reading through reviews seem to have had the same experience. So I don't know, it just kind of fell flat. Overall, it wasn't awful. As I say, I really liked the Georgie section and I, I kind of liked aspects of the second story, but as a whole, I just it, it, it just didn't really work for me, sadly. I think it's still really well written. It's Ali Smith. She has a way with words. Um, I just feel like sometimes she forgets to make her point come across. Um, somehow, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, so I didn't love, love that one. And then I read Mrs Hemingway by Naomi Wood. Um, I really enjoyed this. I've done a separate review of it, which I will link down below if you want to know a bit more. This looks at all of Ernest Hemingway's wives and the relationships that they had with him and with each other. Um, he had four wives in total. He was not the most faithful of husbands to any of them. Um, and he met all of them before leaving his previous wife. And this just looks at how each of them dealt with that. They all had their own different attitudes towards his infidelities. Um, and it looks at, yeah, as I say, how they dealt with what was happening and also how they dealt with each other because a lot of them kind of ended up befriending each other or knowing each other or spending time together um, when they were still married to Ernest Hemingway and yeah, it was a really interesting book. I was a bit worried going into it that it was going to, going to kind of hero worship in Ernest Hemingway um, and it didn't do that at all. The women are so well written and so fleshed out. It, it's really fantastic and I would recommend this one. Then I read Under the Skin by Michelle Faber. This is one of those books is going to be very 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 difficult to speak about because it's one of these books that the story unravels itself as you're reading um needless to say i really really enjoyed this i, I can't tell you why but it's very much like a short story I wrote about two years ago um, and it's kind of given me ideas to go back to that short story because I could never quite make it work and this manages to really make that theme work. Um, so all I can tell you really about this is that we meet a woman called Isalie who picks up hitchhikers um, and she picks them up for a specific reason um, but I can't tell you why or anything else really. I would say read it, it it's really fantastic and it really plays with your perceptions it's it's just well written and again Michelle Faber just blowing me out of the water which is really a relief because The Apple by him um, which is a book of short stories that I read in December really really disappointed me and I didn't like it at all um, so I'm glad that he has sort of wowed me again with this book his writing is always is on point um, and I think the theme is really fascinating and I love the way that the story kind of unravels itself to you and it would be I think an interesting one to reread because it's one of those books where on a reread I think you would spot all the little things um, and you, your view of it would completely change but I would recommend this one and then finally I finished off with Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck this is my old school copies so it is really really tatty and all the pages are falling out but I can't bring myself to buy another one when I already have one I have to say I haven't reread this since being in school and even when I was in school I didn't really read it all the way through you know I read it in sections when we were reading it in class or when we were analyzing sections I don't remember ever just sitting down and reading it and I really really regret that now because I think if I hadn't have known what was coming at the end, I think it would have hit me so, so hard. As it is, obviously, I knew what was coming. Still, it was really impactful. This is a story written in the Great Depression about men who are struggling to make ends meet. It's about dreams and disappointments and it's John Steinbeck so you know it rips your heart out and then it it kind of gives you hope and then it's like no there is no hope don't be silly um it's oh it's just so good I would say that this is nothing on East of Eden or Greats of Wrath or books like that I think because it's short um, you can't get stuck into his language as much as you can with books like East of Eden which is you know quite a weighty book um so it doesn't quite pack the same punch but I would still recommend this if you haven't read it I literally read it in about 
two hours it's only 98 pages long I think um so it's well well worth reading and it it does kind of hurt you it kind of hurts you I felt severely depressed when I finished this book and that doesn't often happen but I would say it's worth a read anyway. As I say, it was only four stars for me in the end. It was not quite to the giddying heights of things like Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden, but I'm really glad that I actually took the time to read it as a whole thing. So, that's all the books. Sorry if this video was really long. As I say, with audiobooks as well, I'm just finding my wrap-ups are far too long and they're also taking millions of years to edit. So, I'm going to start splitting them. But, anyway, please let me know down below what you've been reading in the second half of this month and I will see you next time. Bye!